This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 92, coming up on Space Time. A new measurement for the mass of the most common particle in the universe. NASA finds the wreckage of India's crash lunar lander. And it's all systems go for the launch of Cheops. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists have set a new upper limit for the mass of the neutrino, the most common particle in the universe. The new results indicate the neutrino must have a mass less than 1.1 electron volts. An electron volt is a basic unit of particle energy. The amount of energy gained or lost by a single electron accelerating from rest through an electric potential difference of 1 volt in a vacuum, which is exactly 1.602 by 10 to the minus 19 joule. And thanks to Albert Einstein's famous mass-energy equivalence equation equals mc squared, that is energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, the electron volt is also a unit of mass in physics and astronomy. Measuring the mass of this tiny particle could one day answer some really big questions about the cosmos, including antimatter, the Big Bang origin of the universe, and other cosmological issues. The findings, reported in the journal Physical Review Letters and on the pre-press physics website archive.org, have halved the previous limit of two electron volts, obtained through direct measurements of the neutrino mass. Neutrinos are elementary subatomic particles, generated through radioactive decay in stars, in supernovae, in nuclear explosions, particle accelerators and atomic reactors. The neutrino is so named because it's electrically neutral, and because its rest mass is so small it was long thought to be zero. And having almost no mass means neutrinos are capable of being accelerated to almost the speed of light. Neutrinos come in three known types or flavors, electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos, each with their own specific properties. It seems each of the three neutrino flavors is made up of a quantum mixture of three mass species. So, for example, a particular tau neutrino would contain bits of all three mass species. And those different mass species allow a neutrino to oscillate between the three flavors. For example, an electron neutrino produced through a beta decay reaction could interact in a distant detector as a muon or tau neutrino. Interestingly, although they have no electric charge, neutrinos do have their own corresponding antimatter counterparts, identified by their opposite chirality or handedness. Neutrinos interact with other matter only through gravity and through the weak nuclear force. In fact, they're so weakly interactive that several trillion of them are passing through you right now, without you even noticing. Researchers at the Karlsruhe Tritium Neutrino Collaboration in Germany determined that the neutrino's mass must be less than 1.1 electron volts, or 500,000 times less than an electron's mass, by analysing the beta decay of tritium, a radioactive hydrogen isotope which emitted an electron in a neutrino. By measuring the emitted electron's energies, it allowed the authors to estimate the neutrino's mass as well. You're listening to Space Time. Coming up next... The wreckage from India's crash lunar lander finally found. And it's all systems go for the launch of Cheops, now slated for December 17. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA has found the remains of India's ill-fated Vikram lunar lander, which crashed onto the surface of the moon during a failed landing attempt back in September. Images taken by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter show the spacecraft's wreckage spread over a large debris field with parts scattered over almost two dozen locations spanning several kilometres. The discovery contradicts Indian mission managers who had earlier claimed they had identified the location of the lander, saying it was still in one piece but tilted at an angle. The discovery of the shattered remains dispersed over several kilometres shows that information was badly wrong. Vikram was flown aboard the Indian Space Research Organization's Chandrayaan-2 lunar orbiter. Chandrayaan-2 was launched back in July from the Shatish Dhawan Space Center on the Bay of Bengal coast by the nation's most powerful rocket, the GSLV Mark III. The mission achieved lunar orbit insertion on August 20, deploying the Vikram lander on September 6th. 
Vikram then began a 15-minute descent to the lunar surface, aiming for a touchdown near the lunar south pole around 70 degrees south latitude. Once on the ground, it would spend a full lunar day, approximately two Earth weeks, undertaking a range of scientific experiments. It would also deploy a small six-wheeled rover, which will explore the surrounding landscape. However, as the lander continued its descent, it suddenly began deviating off course at an altitude of about 2.1 kilometers, and then went silent. The final telemetry readings show Vikram's vertical velocity was 58 meters per second, or 210 kilometers per hour, at an altitude of about 330 meters. Now, that's unusually fast, considering the ideal touchdown velocity was meant to be about 2 meters per second, or 7.2 kilometers per hour. Now, all this suggests that something had already gone fatally wrong by that point. Despite numerous attempts, no further contact was made with the lander or its rover. India's Failure Analysis Committee later concluded that the crash was most likely caused by some sort of software glitch. You're listening to Space Time. Still to come, we'll take a look at the December solstice and the rock comet Phaeton, which is about to provide its annual Geminids meteor shower. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The European Space Agency's exoplanetary explorer spacecraft CHEOPS has been slated for launch on December 17. CHEOPS, short for Characterizing Exoplanet Satellite, will fly aboard a Russian Soyuz rocket from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. CHEOPS is a joint mission of the European Space Agency in Switzerland, led by the University of Bern in collaboration with the University of Geneva. 140 minutes after launch, Soyuz will deploy CHEOPS into a 700-kilometer high orbit. As well as CHEOPS, the Soyuz launch vehicle will also be carrying five small CubeSats into orbit. The first data from CHEOPS is expected in early 2020. The probe will utilize a specially built onboard telescope to study exoplanets, that is, planets orbiting stars other than the Sun, in order to determine their size. It'll observe and measure the tiny changes in a star's brightness caused by a planet crossing in front of the star and blocking out some of its starlight. The mission will specifically target Earth to Neptune-sized planets, trying to make the most precise possible measurements of their size. This data, together with available information about the masses of these planets, will provide their average density, allowing scientists to calculate their likely composition and structure, and helping them determine whether these planets are predominantly rocky worlds like the Earth, gas planets like Jupiter, or water worlds with deep oceans. And this in turn will allow scientists to determine the probability of these planets ever being habitable. This report from ESA TV. By searching beyond the skies, the Geneva Observatory is helping to answer questions about the nature of the universe we live in. In 1995 at the observatory, Michel Meyer and Didier Kahlo co-discovered the first ever exoplanet orbiting a sun-like star outside our solar system. In these days, I was using a technique that we call radial velocity, which is um, observing a star and looking for any change of speed in the star. Well, since then, the field has just exploded. As, as you may know, there is really now thousands of exoplanets. Um, there are a lot of planets known uh, to be transiting, which means the planet goes right in front of the star. And, um, and that's these techniques that we're using for, for the Kerbs mission. The Kops Space Telescope can measure this tiny dip in light from the star during the transit. Kops's uh, aim is to measure the size of already known exoplanets. So it's not a discovery mission. It is really aimed at precisely measure the size. And once we have the size and possibly the mass, we can derive the mean density. And from then we know a little bit what the planet is made of. The exoplanets to be observed by Kops are typically small and range from rocky and hot to gaseous like Jupiter with possible Earth-like planets in between. Many have been discovered at much closer distances to their host star than those in our solar system, some taking just a few days to complete an orbit. There are differences too in how today's search for exoplanets is conducted, with space-based facilities complementing ground-based telescopes, and racks of computers to process data from targeted stars and exoplanets. 
The observatory also houses the CAEPS Science Operations Center. We're sending the observation program to the Mission Operations Center in, in uh, Madrid, uh, where then the information is uplinked to the actual instrument. The instrument is configured to observe the, the star, and then the telemetry, the data is downlinked uh, to the Mission Operations Center and right away forwarded to us here in Geneva, where we then can do the data processing, uh, archive the data, and then provide it to the scientists uh, all over Europe and to the world. The Compact Science Operations Centre at the heart of the mission also reflects the compact size of Cheops's telescope. It is just one and a half metres long, but will punch well above its weight and size. There are now over 4,000 known exoplanets and counting, and through repeated observations of several hundred of them, the mission will provide an important insight into the inner structure of exoplanets, how they form, and evolve. And that report from ECTV featured Didier Kalo, the head of the Cheops science team, as well as Cheops principal investigator Vili Bentz from the University of Bern and Cheops ground segment manager Matthias Beck. This is Space Time. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies with December Skywatch. December is the 12th and final month of the year, both in the Julian and Gregorian calendars. December got its name from the Latin word decim, meaning 10, because it was originally the 10th month of the year in the old Roman calendar, which began in March. The December solstice will occur at 1519 Australian Eastern Daylight Time on the afternoon of Sunday, December the 22nd, when the sun reaches zenith, appearing to be directly over the Tropic of Capricorn. That'll be 11.19 in the evening of Saturday, December the 21st, U.S. Eastern Standard Time, and 4.19 in the morning of Sunday, December the 22nd, Greenwich Mean Time. In the United States and the Northern Hemisphere, it's the winter solstice, marking the first day of winter. Of course, south of the equator, summer has well and truly arrived. On the day of the December solstice, Earth's south pole is tilted towards the sun. The sun will rise south of east and set south of west, reaching its most southerly declination of 23.4 degrees. The seasons are governed by the tilt of Earth's axis as it journeys around the sun in a year. Temperatures on the planet aren't determined by Earth's orbital distance from the sun, but rather the angle of the sun's rays striking the Earth. So in summer, the sun is high in the sky and the rays hit Earth at a steep angle while in winter the sun's low in the sky and its rays strike the Earth at a more shallow angle. A lot of people confuse the summer solstice with Earth's closest orbital position to the sun, perihelion, which occurs about two weeks after the December solstice, and its furthest orbital position from the sun, aphelion, which occurs about two weeks after the June solstice. Now that means the next perihelion will occur on Sunday, January the 5th, 2020, at 1847 in the evening Australian Eastern Daylight Time, when the Earth's centre will be just 147,091,144 kilometres from the centre of the Sun. That'll be 2.47 in the morning US Eastern Standard Time and 7.47 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. OK, let's start our tour of the night skies in the west, where midway up from the horizon is Fulmerholt, the brightest star in the constellation Pisces Austrinus, the southern fish. Fulmerholt is a young white spectral type A main sequence star, about 1.8 times the diameter of the sun, located about 25 light years away. A light year is about 10 trillion kilometres, the distance a photon can travel in a year at 300,000 kilometres per second, which is the speed of light in a vacuum and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. A main sequence star is one undergoing the fusion of hydrogen into helium in its core, the process which makes stars shine. In 2008, astronomers detected planets orbiting around Fulmerholt. It's not known if anyone was looking back. 5,000 years ago, the ancient Mesopotamians used Fulmerholt to mark the Northern Hemisphere's winter solstice. Turning to the left of Fulmerholt, you'll see Achenar, or Alpha Aridini, the brightest star in the constellation of Eridanus, the river. Located 139 light years away, Achenar has about 7 times the diameter of the Sun and rotates some 15 times faster, giving it an incredibly oblate shape. The effect of that rapid rotation is that the star flattens at the top and bottom, but bulges in the middle through centrifugal force. In fact, its equatorial diameter is about 50% greater than its polar diameter. Achenar is actually part of a multiple star system, Alpha Aridini A and Alpha Aridini B. 
The primary star, Alpha Ridney A, is a hot blue spectrotype B main sequence star. Its smaller companion, Alpha Ridney B, is a spectrotype A white star. The pair orbit each other at a distance of around 12 astronomical units. An astronomical unit being the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. Moving further left from Achenar, just above the horizon, is Canopus. It's the brightest star in the southern constellation of Carina the Keel, and the second brightest star in the night sky after Sirius. Canopus is a white giant nearing the end of its life, located about 310 light years away. It has about 8.5 times the mass of the Sun, but has expanded out to some 71 times the Sun's diameter. It has some 1,300 times the brightness of the Sun, and is in fact the brightest star within 700 light years of Earth. Its name originates in mythology from the time of the Trojan Wars and the navigator for Menelaus, the king of Sparta. Located between Canopus and the Southern Cross, you'll find the Trumpler 16 open star cluster. And in there is the ticking time bomb Eta Carina. Eta Carina is a pair of huge blue stars undergoing the violent final phase of their existence before exploding as massive core collapse supernovae. The binary system's located some 7,500 light years away and is buried deep inside the great nebula of Carina, a massive cloud of gas and dust stretching from 6,500 to 10,000 light years away. Eta Carina is classified as highly luminous spectral type O blue hypergiants. Its primary star is estimated to be somewhere between 150 and 200 times the mass of the Sun, with up to 5 million times the Sun's luminosity, 800 times its radius, and a surface temperature of around 32,500 Kelvin. The companion star, although smaller than the primary at just 80 solar masses and 20 times the Sun's radius, is even hotter, with surface temperatures around 37,200 Kelvin. Now, by comparison, our sun's surface temperature is only around 6,000 degrees. The two stars in Eta Carina orbit each other every 5.54 Earth years, cocooned in a gigantic twin-lobed cloud of dust and gas known as the Homunculus Nebula. This bipolar emission and reflection nebula was created when Eta Carina underwent a spectacular eruption starting in 1837. Known as the Great Eruption, it eventually reached its peak in 1843 when it was one of the brightest objects in the night sky, before gradually fading away again by 1856. Eta Carina underwent a similar smaller eruption in 1892, and it's again been steadily brightening ever since around 1940. Both Eta Carina and its surrounding shroud of gas generate huge amounts of infrared radiation, making it the brightest infrared source in the sky. Both stars are now reaching the ends of their lives in the main sequence and are expected to go supernova in an astronomically short space of time. When it does go supernova, Eta Carina will be visible in daylight and may even become brighter than the moon for several months on end. OK, let's turn to the east now, and looking just above the horizon, you'll find the star that outshines Canopus to take the title as the brightest star in the night sky. I am, of course, talking about the dog star Sirius. Sirius is twice as bright as Canopus. It's actually two stars. There's a young spectral type A main sequence white star, Sirius A, which is about twice as big and 25 times as bright as the Sun. And then there's Sirius B, a small white dwarf, the remnant white hot core of a dead star. This binary system is between 200 and 300 million years old and was originally composed of two bright white stars. But the more massive of these, Sirius B consumed its resources and became a red giant before shedding off its outer layers and collapsing into its current state as a white dwarf around 120 million years ago. At a distance of just 8.6 light years, Sirius is the fifth nearest star to the Sun. And it's getting closer every day. You see, Sirius is gradually moving towards our solar system, so it will gradually continue to increase its apparent brightness as seen from Earth over the next 60,000 years. Now earlier I referred to Sirius as the dog star that reflects its prominence in its constellation Canis Major, the greater dog. The helical rising of Sirius marked the flooding of the River Nile in ancient Egypt and the hot, sultry dog days of summer for the ancient Greeks. Helical rising refers to the first time of the year when a star becomes visible above the eastern horizon for a brief moment just before sunrise. By carefully monitoring and watching Sirius's movements across the sky, the ancient Egyptians determined that it would be visible every night for 295 and a quarter nights, followed by 70 nights of absence. 
and this allowed them to determine that the Earth year was 365 and a quarter days long. And remember, they did all this thousands of years ago. Not far from Sirius in the east-northeastern skies, just above the horizon, you'll see the constellation of Orion the Hunter, and in it you'll see a really bright red star. Well, that's the red supergiant Betelgeuse, better known to most people these days as Betelgeuse. Don't say it three times. In ancient times, before centuries of mispronunciation, the name started out as Ibdal Jalza. Betelgeuse is one of the largest and most luminous stars visible with the unaided eye. Located some 430 light years away, this bloated old star nearing the end of its life is truly massive, some 1,100 times the diameter and 100,000 times the brightness of our sun. Like Eta Carina, Betelgeuse is destined to explode as a core collapse supernova sometime in the near future. Betelgeuse marks the right shoulder of Orion the Hunter, although it's all upside down from the perspective of anyone in the Southern Hemisphere, as Orion was a hunter in Greek mythology, the constellation was viewed from the Northern Hemisphere. The earliest depiction that's been linked to the constellation of Orion is a prehistoric mammoth ivory carving that was found in the cave in the Arch Valley in West Germany back in 1979. Archaeologists estimate it must have been fashioned sometime between 32,000 and 38,000 years ago. The distinctive pattern of Orion has been recognised in numerous cultures around the world, including the ancient Babylonian star catalogues dating back to the Late Bronze Age. In Greek mythology, Orion was a gigantic, supernaturally strong hunter of ancient times, the son of a Gorgon and Poseidon, also known as Neptune, the god of the sea in Greco-Roman tradition. The goddess Gaia became angry with Orion after he boasted that he would kill every animal on Earth. So she sent a scorpion to sting Orion to death. However, Ophiuchus the serpent bearer revived Orion with an antidote. This is the given reason why the constellation Scorpius chases Orion across the sky, with the constellation Ophiuchus standing midway between them. The other major stars in Orion include Rigel, Orion's left foot, actually a blue supergiant. Having exhausted its core hydrogen, Rigel is now swollen up between 79 and 115 times the sun's radius. It's now fusing heavy elements in its core, meaning it will soon explode in a supernova and then collapse down to form a neutron star. Rigel is estimated to be somewhere between 120,000 and 179,000 times as luminous as the sun. It's actually a binary system located 860 light years away. Its companion star, Rigel B, is some 500 times fainter than the supergiant Rigel A and can only be seen with a telescope. Rigel B itself is a spectroscopic binary system comprising two main-sequence blue-white stars. Spectroscopic binaries are double star systems orbiting each other in such a way that they can only be visually separated from our vantage point on Earth by their spectroscopic signatures. The two stars making up Rigel B are estimated to be 3.9 and 2.9 times the mass of the Sun, respectively. And one of these stars, Rigel BB, may itself be a binary. Rigel B also appears to have a very close visual companion, Rigel C, almost identical in appearance. The third brightest star in Orion is Bellatrix, Orion's left shoulder. It's also a spectrotype B main-sequence blue star, about 8.6 times the mass and 6 times the radius of our Sun. Bellatrix is about 250 light-years away. It has an estimated age of about 25 million years. That's old enough for a star of this mass to consume all the hydrogen in its core and begin to evolve away from the main sequence into a blue giant. If you look at the three stars which make up Orion's belt, you'll see another three stars which make up the Sword of Orion, which is hanging from the belt. And again, that's hanging upwards for those in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, if you look carefully at the middle star, you'll notice it's a little bit fuzzy looking. That's because it's not a star, but the great nebula of Orion, Messier 42. Located 1,344 light years away, M42 is the nearest massive star forming region to Earth. The M42 nebula is estimated to be about 24 light years across and contains about 2,000 solar masses. The Orion Nebula is one of the most scrutinised and photographed objects in the night sky, and it's among the most intensely studied celestial features. This nebula has revealed much to astronomers about the process of how stars and planetary systems are formed from collapsing molecular gas and dust clouds. By studying M42, scientists have directly observed protoplanetary disks, brown dwarfs, intense and turbulent motions of gas, 
and the photoionizing effects of massive nearby stars in the nebula. The Orion Nebula also contains a very young open star cluster known as the Trapezium due to its asterisk of four primary stars. The Trapezium is a component of the much larger Orion Nebula cluster, an association of about 2,800 stars with a diameter of some 20 light years. One of the most stunning nebula within the constellation of Orion is the spectacular Horsehead Nebula, Barnard 33. The Horsehead is a dark nebula located just south of the star Alnatak, which is the furthest east on Orion's belt and is part of the much larger Orion Molecular Cloud Complex. Located 1500 light years away, the Horsehead Nebula was first recorded in 1888. It's one of the most identifiable nebulae because of the shape of its swirling clouds of dark dust and gases, which bears more than a passing resemblance to a horse's head when viewed from Earth. One of the astronomical highlights of December is the annual Geminids meteor shower, which is peaking around now. Radiating out from the direction of the constellation Gemini, the Geminids are unusual in that they're not generated by a comet as most other meteor showers are, but are produced by the debris trail left behind by the asteroid 3200 Phaeton. This makes the Geminids, together with the Quadrantids, the only major meteor showers not originating from a comet. 3200 Phaeton is highly unusual. Its high orbital eccentricity more closely resembles that of a comet than an asteroid, and it may in fact be an asteroid that simply ran out of the volatile gases that characterize a comet. Phaeton's orbit crosses the inner terrestrial planets Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Because of this, this 5 km wide space mountain is classified as potentially hazardous. Phaeton is named after the son of the Greek sun god Helios. Legend claims Phaeton almost destroyed the Earth by stealing Helios's chariot and then scorching the Earth with the Sun, almost causing the apocalypse. In fact, Phaeton approaches the Sun closer than any other named asteroid, with a perihelion of less than 21 million kilometers. That's less than half of Mercury's perihelion distance. Now, coming so close to the Sun causes Phaeton's surface temperature to reach over 750 degrees Celsius. Observations by NASA's stereo spacecraft have observed dust trails radiating off its surface. And in 2010, Phaeton was detected ejecting dust. Scientists think what's happening is that the intense heat generated by its close approaches to the Sun is causing fractures in gravel and rocks on the asteroid surface, similar to mud cracks in a dry lake bed. Phaeton's composition also fits the notion of a cometary origin. It's classified as a B-type asteroid because it's composed of dark material. B-type asteroids are thought to be primitive volatile rich elements of the early solar system. In fact, its composition combined with its orbit and its dust trail has led astronomers to refer to Phaeton as a rock comet. And that's certainly appropriate because the Geminids meteors are very different to most meteors. They have a yellowish hue and tend to be a bit bigger and more solid than typical meteors from comets. They also move more slowly, travelling at around 35 km per second, compared to some cometary meteor showers, which travel at speeds of up to 72 km per second. Interestingly, the Geminids are thought to be intensifying every year, with recent showers seeing up to 160 meteors per hour under optimal conditions. In the Northern Hemisphere, expect to see up to 120 meteors per hour between midnight and 4am, but only from really dark skies. Well north of the equator, the radiant rises at about sunset, reaching a usable elevation from local evening hours onwards. Now, in the southern hemisphere, you won't see nearly as many Geminids, perhaps 10 to 20 an hour. That's because the radiant doesn't rise above the horizon. Now, also for listeners in the northern hemisphere, there's a second meteor shower in December, the Ursiids, which radiate out from Ursa Major, the Little Dipper. The Ursiids are generated by debris left behind by the comet 8P Tuttle. They're a compact stream, peaking on the night of December 22nd and the early morning hours of December the 23rd. Just look towards the bowl of the Little Dipper and you might see about 10 or so meteors per hour. And now, with the rest of the December night sky, we're joined by Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. G'day Stuart. Well, let's start in the middle of the evening, December. We've got the Milky Way stretching across the eastern sky from north to south. If you go out and look to the east... That's the uh, direction where the sun comes up, but of course we're looking at night time, so the sun is 
gone the other way. But if you look out to the east, you see the Milky Way stretching all the way from the north to the south, as long as your skies are sufficiently dark. Now, for us down here, of course, things we like to see in the south, we've got the Southern Cross and all those sort of things. Bad time of the year to see the Southern Cross, which disappoints a lot of people who come from overseas because they come down to Australia, of course, when it's summertime here, December, and they say, where's the Southern Cross? And you can't see it, at least not during the evening hours, depending on where you are. So from someone, say, in Sydney, mid-evening hours, December, you're not going to see the Southern Cross because it's too far down towards the southern horizon. If you're down in Melbourne or, or Hobart down in Tasmania, you should be able to see the Southern Cross, but from, you know, up in Queensland, you're not going to see it. You have to wait until after midnight when the Earth has turned a bit more and the cross will have risen and it'll be sort of sitting on its left-hand side uh, looking a bit like a kite shape. So if you go out in the middle of the evening and think, I can't see the Southern Cross, don't worry, you're not going mad. You, you literally cannot see the Southern Cross. But anyway, you can see lots of other things. This is a good time of the year, actually, to see two other things that are really interesting in the southern sky if you have sufficiently dark nights, and that is the large and small Magellanic Clouds. Now, these are two of the satellite galaxies of our own Milky Way, and they're quite big in the sky. You look for something small and bright and intense, but these are actually quite big and fuzzy and faint. So if you've got dark skies and you let your eyes get dark adapted for 20 minutes or so, or 30 minutes, so you're not standing directly under a street light, you will be able to see them, and they're sort of up about, oh, what would you say, about a third of the way up the sky, directly down south. They just look like two fuzzy patches. These are actual galaxies. It's quite amazing if you can see galaxies with your naked eye. 168,000 light years for the Large Magellanic Cloud and what, 200,000 light years for the small Magellanic Cloud? Yeah, right next door, galactically speaking. So they are very, very close. But, you know, you can only see them from the southern sky. You can only see them down here because they are very, very far south. You can't see them from the northern hemisphere. So if you're an Aussie or a Kiwi and you're down here and you haven't had a look at these before, go out and have a look. If you're visiting from overseas, take the opportunity to find some dark guys and dark sites somewhere and get out and have a look at these beautiful galaxies. Mind you, now, they're getting smaller and smaller every day because the Milky Way is slowly cannibalizing both of them. I wish I was getting smaller and smaller every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's all those galaxies I'm eating. Isn't it a chocolate bar or something? <laughs> Milky Way chocolate bar. Anyway, so what are we talking about? The large Magellanic Clouds. And then look to the east. That's to the left if you're looking south. You'll find a really bright star called Canopus. And this is the second brightest star in the night sky, actually. You really can't miss it. It's really, really bright. Further still around to the east, around to the left, if you're looking south, you will see the brightest star in the sky. And that's known as the Dog Star because it's in the constellation Canis Major, or Greater Dog. And that star, of course, is Sirius. So why? While we're looking over there in the east, what you'll see about halfway up from the horizon is Stuart Gary's favourite constellation, Orion the Hunter. It's lots of people's favourite constellation, actually. Uh, well, together with the uh, Southern Cross, I use Orion as my starting point, so I can sort of work my way across the sky once I've found those two. You can indeed. They're, they're so prominent. They've got a, such an amazing prominent shape, Orion and the Southern Cross. In fact, I was reading a blog not recently from a, an American amateur astronomer who'd come down to the south and you know heard all these things about the Southern Cross and all. Or how, how good can it be? It's just four stars, you know, or four or five stars. But then when he saw it, he thought, wow, this is amazing. He said, it's just as amazing as Orion, you know. Wow. It, it, the, the, the stars are... The, 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 the sort of compactness of the grouping of stars and how bright they are, it just reminded him of how stunning Orion is. So that's, that's pretty good, you know. That's a good indication. We, we sort of tend to live with it down here. We always know the Southern Cross is there, but for someone who has never really seen it before to come down and say, well, look, it's just as good as Orion, that's, that's pretty good praise. So anyway, so we're talking about Orion. You really can't miss it with its three middle stars in a row, one next to each other. That's, the, that's Hunter's belt. And above and below the belt, you've got the bright stars Rigel and Betelgeuse, forming the, you've got the head and the feet and everything. Now, to the west of Orion, looking around to the north and west of Orion, you'll see a reddish star that makes up one corner of a triangle or a wedge of stars. They're pretty easy to see. It's really quite noticeable. The bright star is called Aldebaran and the triangle is a star cluster called the Hyades. You don't need a telescope to see it. You can see it with the unaided eye. If you've got a pair of binoculars, take a look. It's even better because you'll see more stars in this grouping. But if you think that's good, keep looking around further to the left and you'll see another smaller, more compact, but more prominent star cluster. You can see it with the naked eye, and that, of course, is the Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters, because most people can make out seven of these really bright, intense little stars just with the naked eye. In fact, the interesting thing, of course, is that it's known as the Seven Sisters in various different cultures spread around the world from dating back from times when 
those cultures weren't in contact with each other. It's a lot like the flood story with Noah and all that. Different cultures around the world all have their own version of the flood story, even though mm. those cultures have never been in contact with each other. It's just something they've brought with them mm. when they migrated to their current homelands. Yeah, and then everyone's seen these stars and they're pretty and they're a nice little group and uh, prettiness is often associated with femininity and that, so they, they call them the Seven Sisters. And in a lot of cultures, they also have these Seven Sisters being chased by Orion. They do. Yeah. yeah, it's basically the same everywhere. Amazing. So the Pleiades, they're really, really beautiful. If you get a pair of binoculars on a, onto them, you'll see that there are more stars than you can see with the naked eye. A telescope, you can see more stars still. There are actually, I think, about a thousand stars uh, in this, this group. And the other interesting thing is that you should be, if you had a telescope, for instance, you should be able to make out some wispy sort of cloud mixed in amongst them. And you can see this very clearly on long exposure photographs that these stars seem to be embedded in this beautiful wispy blue nebulosity. For a long time, people thought they were sort of one and the same thing. It was stars moving through some nebulosity. They now know that they're most likely just a line of sight effect and the nebulosity and the stars aren't actually connected. They just happen to be in the same direction as we look at them. They're a fascinating sight, the Pleiades. We don't really know how far away they are. There are a number of estimates, but uh, this is one of those open star clusters that uh, has been able to retain some of its mystery. The estimates for its distance range quite significantly. Yeah, that's because those estimates have been made using different methods. Yeah, yeah. There are ones using satellites, ones using other, other sort of methods, and there's a range of distances. That's because you can never be 100% exact with any sort of measurement, there's always going to be a margin of error. And sometimes, depending on, if you've got two two or three totally different ways of measuring something, and they've each got different margins of error, then you can end up with a, quite a wide discrepancy. Now, um, what's happening with the planets? So the planets this month, December 2019, uh, let's start in the, at the beginning. Mercury, the innermost planet, well, it's a bit of a write-off this month, I'm afraid. It's, it's just skirting the eastern horizon before dawn very low down and very hard to see you'd really you'd really have difficulty finding it even if you knew where to look for it so i would give it a miss wait a couple of months and it's going to be much easier to see so that's in the morning I mean, in the evening sky venus is actually quite easy to see out in the west where the sun is setting uh, as twilight begins even just as the sun's gone down and you know, the sky's getting dark you should still be able to see venus it's actually going to be climbing higher and higher above the horizon night after night as the weeks go by and if you go out and have a look you should see another brightish light just near Venus and that'll actually be the planet Saturn they'll be fairly close together Jupiter is out in the western sky too after sunset but it's getting lower and lower it's starting off low and it's getting lower and lower as the days go by and by the end of the month it'll actually have disappeared into the glare of the sun because it's going around the other side of the sun from us what we call conjunction so it's going to be on one side we're going to be on the other side and with the sun in the middle so we just can't see it this is a time when well for instance there is the, there is a spacecraft at Jupiter right now called Juno of Juno, course yes yeah so so when this happens, then for a period of weeks, NASA or some other space agency, if they've got a spacecraft in a similar situation, you know, they're out of contact because... Uh, well, we've just had that with Mars and the uh, flotilla of spacecraft orbiting Mars. That's right. There's nothing you can do about it. You just have to wait until the planet comes into the line of sight again or far enough away from the sun in angle that you can get signals through, uh, you know, radio signals in this case. So that's what's happening with Jupiter. Saturn is a bit the same. Saturn is higher in the sky than the Jupiter, a bit higher, but it too is sinking slower and slower in the west after sunset, and it's heading for this conjunction thing where it's on the other side of the sun in January. So we'll lose sight of it for a while beginning in January onwards. So uh, where are we? So we're sort of towards the end of December. So a couple of things at the end of December. On the 22nd, our planet will reach the uh, solstice, of course. It's the summer solstice for the southern hemisphere and the winter solstice for the northern hemisphere. On December 22nd, just, just due to the tilt of the Earth's axis, the sun will be at its most southerly point in the sky, right over what's called the Tropic of Capricorn, which is latitude 23 and a half degrees south. This is when the hours of daylight are longest in the southern hemisphere and they're shortest in the northern hemisphere, so it's basically summer, winter. Finally, right at the end of December, on the 26th, there's going to be an eclipse of the sun. Now, we're going to have another annular solar eclipse. This is where the, the moon, when it moves directly in front of the sun, doesn't entirely cover the sun up because the moon is a little bit further away in its orbit on that particular day. Therefore, it seems to be a bit smaller when you look at it in the sky. So it doesn't entirely cover the sun. You still get a thin ring of sunlight poking around the edge of the moon. Some people call it a, a ring of fire eclipse, but the formal name is an annular solar eclipse. So this will be on the 26th. Now the path of annularity, which is equivalent to the to the path of totality, it's where you have to be if you want to see the real deal. That's going to stretch from the Middle East through to Southeast Asia, which means that observers in some part of Australia will get to see a partial solar eclipse. We won't see the real thing, we'll just see the moon sort of move in front of some of the sun, we'll get a partial eclipse. 
Specifically, partial phases will be visible from most of Western Australia, some parts of South Australia, most of the Northern Territory and far northern Queensland. The other southern states are going to miss out this time, I'm afraid, but there'll be uh, other eclipses next year. And that, Stuart, is what's happening uh, this month in the sky. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary, and you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 